So today we're going to talk about um, scholarship of teaching and learning, which is actually quite a um, um, hot topic nowadays. In fact, this week, on these two weeks, I attended two other sessions on scholarship of teaching and learning um, at Hong Kong U. So um, here we are really going to share with um, our communities of um, our scholarship of teaching and learning project and initiatives and ideas. So um, let me just oop, start with the um, program to remind us of the things that we have planned for today. Okay, so as the subtitle that I put in, I said, I'm empowering teachers for student learning enhancement. So it's very related to us, the teachers and supporting students learning. Please also um, have a look at this um, well, definition that I put together. Uh, you may disagree with some of the points or you may have some modification to it. Let's talk about it at the end. All right, so I want to highlight a few uh, keywords here. All right, this is about inquiry on teaching practice and with the purpose of enhancing students' learning outcomes. So that means it is to aim at improving our teaching and improving our courses and programs. But the focus is on reflection and scholarly um, study of students' learning, hoping that there would be some innovations, changes, or enhancement of practice. And other important aspects of it, it is uh, for public dissemination, like what we are going to do here. So we are going to share within our communities of practice and for continuous improvement of teaching and learning. So just want to give this um, rough definition here to remind us um, what uh, it could be seen as for scholarship of teaching and learning. So today we have 16 colleagues um, going to uh, do, they are from five centers, going to do um, 12 presentations. So we have a very tight program. So we must keep our time to eight minutes per presentation. So um, each part, we have three presentations. So the first part is on um, EAP, ESP. And then the second, and then we will have a, an eight minute discussion time. We really want to give colleagues to ask questions and to share their thought and reflection after a few presentations. And then we have um, independent learning session. Then we will have a break. Uh, before that, we have some discussion time. Then we will be focusing on pedagogy with three presentations and a short discussion time. And then at the end, we have presentations related to practices. I have to say that they are all, these are not really you know, separated, they are all interrelated. And they are, we can see that from the, from the uh, titles, they are all really very recent initiatives and project um, from uh, different centers. At the end, uh, I hope that we will have some time, if some of you would stay behind, could continue to talk, um, to share further ideas and insights that you have after listening to the presentations on uh, ideas for scholarship of teaching and learning project initiatives or collaboration. Okay, so um, Lucas will remind us when it is 20 seconds to the eight minutes for per, per presentation. So he would ring a bell. Um, okay, all right. Then uh, um, I also want to introduce my uh, other two facilitators, Christy and LP. Uh, I'm Christy. Yeah, Do you I'm... see me? Okay, yeah. I'm Christy from City University of Hong Kong. Um, it has been a pleasure seeing most of your faces in the last three and a half years. And this is some of the um, last events of the year. And I hope you will enjoy today's sessions. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I'm LP from UST. You also enjoyed the uh, section today and next Tuesday. 
yeah, and next Tuesday. And we also have two other sessions on Friday I'll mention or remind you later. So these are our last four hub event. Okay, so let's get on to the first part of the presentation. So we have three presentations um, from Hong Kong U and uh, one from, uh, no, two, two from Hong Kong U and one from City U. So now let's hand over to Albert Wong from CAES Hong Kong U. Thank you, um, Albert. Thank you, Lillian, for the introduction. I'd like to know if there's a way I can share the, oh, yeah, I've, I've just been given the permission to share the screen here. So just bear with me for a second. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Albert, and I'm actually um, in charge of the teaching of um, an, an uh, ED course. We call it an ED course, an English in a Discipline course here at the University of Hong Kong, uh, Center for Applied English Studies, that actually tackles um, a genre um, which we call professional communication. And as the title suggests, perhaps it's um, something that in, can be um, you know, um, broadly envisioned as a kind of talk production that occurs within a particular disciplinary context. But um, just um, you know, a note of caution over here before I start. Um, by architecture, we don't just mean because of the, the structure of the faculty here, um, we have various program provisions, um, so we don't just mean um, architectural studies per se, but we also have programs such as, um, say, for example, the Bachelor of Science in Surveying. There's also um, a program in landscape architecture. Uh, there's urban studies and also conservation, which is, um, you know, um, we're, we're actually seeing the very last cohort um, in our teaching this year. Um, so in this particular session, what I'd like to um, tackle here um, is... Um, the kind of discourse that we actually see um, in um, the, the settings that students are faced with, like in their faculty, which um, relates to their work, you know, the design work they produce, um, but which um, often is, um, you know, kind of uh, a kind of alien language to us, really. Studio discourse um, goes hand in hand with design. So most of the time when we talk about facilitating students, um, you know, academic literacy, in our studio discourse, we're talking about helping them express design ideas, many of which we're not extremely familiar with. Okay, um, it also carries a kind of um, effective dimension. So most of the time, with our studio discourse, um, it's uh, positioned as a kind of uh, tool for language learning. Uh, for sorry, for learning and teaching within the context of the discipline. So what that means is that um, there's a very significant way in which um, a lot of emotions are exchanged because of the high stake nature of studio assessment um, and also that um, the exchanges between the students and their professors in the faculty actually also um, are very much a part of the learning dialogue. And um, most of the time, the kinds of questions that are asked as well as the kinds of um, design feedback, you know, that students receive, um, also um, get, you know, recorded um, in a kind of portfolio, um, which would then affect the assessment results, okay, but in a very indirect way, as we see, and sometimes not in a very consistent fashion, because, um, you know, studio discourse does vary from one studio setting to another. Okay, as you'll see from uh, my talk today, um, there's also a very um, strong subjective and interpersonal dimension, which influences the way students deliver their studio talk. So most of the time, um, there's also a kind of filtering of what particular tutors are after in terms of, um, say, in architecture, um, whether some students would actually prefer that you talk about line weight or perhaps the shading of certain, you know, um, design um, that might actually go into the decisions of the students in um, channeling their studio talk efforts. So um, our program um, at CAES actually focuses on um, professional communications, as we said. Um, the first sentence of our course description actually already tackles um, this dimension. We do say that we want to respond effectively to the communication demands of uh, the studio programs and their future careers. And obviously that's a, a very ambitious goal. We look at persuasive language in speaking and writing. And of course, to persuade is a very important um, you know, uh, skill to actually gain as an architect and um, surveyor, um, as well as those in other disciplines. 
spontaneous speaking ability is important over here because most of the time in the studio you are not just presenting on your ideas but you take uh, questions from the audience um, in relation to the design that you have produced okay in the course of um, the studio program so um, one kind of feedback that I actually put together here this is um, and I'll give you a, mo a minute or two to actually just look at say um, the scaffolding that we actually give so basically um, to give you an idea of what we do um, basically, at the start of every semester, um, in the initial weeks, we actually have spontaneous speaking activities. This year, I've actually made a decision to give students an option. So, um, other than doing the uh, standard um, tasks that they might have been assigned, okay, they can also record um, a studio talk sample, okay, um, on the basis of what they produced. Um, it was actually early in the semester, so I gave them the option of recording something from a previous semester, so maybe a project they actually worked on, or maybe a competition they joined, okay, even last summer. And they'd, they'd actually give me a sample of how they talk through their design ideas. Um, in my class, uh, most students took this um, option um, of producing a studio talk, and that was the first stage of um, the collection of this, uh, this sort of samples. And this was how I reacted to um, you know, the way they approach this particular studio talk task. Okay, so I'll give you a minute just to go through it and I'll highlight some of the things I mentioned in particular. How much time do I still have there? <laughs> How much time do I still have there, sorry? Uh, two, around two minutes. Okay, no problem. So just to highlight some of the over here um, in relation to um, the effectiveness of the, the, the discourse. So basically over here, I focused on descriptive language use, as well as this, the way students actually took, um, you know, the instructors through, say, for example, uh, example dimensional uh, references um, in their presentation. So um, I'd say, for example, look at this sentence that I heard, enforcing a very small footprint to minimize environmental impact. How did you, I mean, um, illustrate this idea with reference to your design? Um, so you can, uh, and there was another one. So you can see these parts are timber parts tailored into very specific details and to be joined in a very specific way. Um, I wasn't quite sure what specific meant over there in, in, in that particular context. So I sort of had this uh, follow up session where I took the students through and this was actually a feedback session. Um, I'll show you in a moment um, if I have the time there. Um, but on the basis of the discussion, so these were the suggestions I, I co-produced with the students because um, what the feedback, when the feedback was given, I was only um, you know, I only had the input from the students telling me briefly about what they would do, what the tutors would comment on, but I didn't have a very realistic picture of how the students, I mean, how the tutors would comment on their work. So during the feedback session, the dialogic feedback session, we actually had um, suggestions from students, which then led to um, the, uh, the further task, which I got them to um, produce. And so there was a second stage where students then revised the sample uh, based on the suggestions we worked on during the feedback dialogue. And um, I wish I had time to show you how students improved um, during the course of those um, six weeks. But yeah, um, I'll, I'll be happy to share the samples. But what this project has led to, um, this you know very small scale teaching project has led to, um, is one that we'll be working on further this summer, looking at research collaboration with faculty members, looking at say how Studio Talk operates as part of um, a significant assessment component. We'll also be looking at feedback discourse uh, research, looking at actual student support, say for example, analyzing the teacher feedback and looking at how well they, um, you know, uh, simulate the kind of feedback they receive from tutors and see where we can be more aligned with um, the kinds of, um, you know, teacher feedback that they receive from their tutors to better prepare us in tackling the academic literacy needs arising from their, um, you know, program context. So thank you very much for this. I'll be happy to take questions from the floor um, later on and be uh, happy to exchange with you um, later on about, you know, say ideas uh, relating to uh, the teaching of this uh, strand um, of professional training. Thank you very much. Right, thank you, Albert. Uh, we will also be collecting the PowerPoint uh, from the presenters later to share with you on the Hub website. Okay, now, thank you. And uh, let's hand over to Ashley.
ASO also from CAES Hong Kong U. Ashley, please. Okay, can I share my? Yes. Okay, one minute. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ashley from CAES. And I'm Marvin, a second year nursing student and one of the student partners for the project. And here we've got on the right, very static, um, Harry, Nicholas, Philip, Julius, and Donald in order. They couldn't be with us today. They're the other students as partners. So um, this project is part of a relatively new initiative at Hong Kong U and at CAES. I'll explain what SAP is in a while, and Marvin will show you some of the outcomes as well. Um, so in short, uh, the students you see here are all volunteer students who were interested in the common cause of improving the learning of medical terminology for nursing students. So our CAS course is a second year compulsory academic communication for nursing students. So first of all, really briefly, there's a lot of uh, literature on SAP and um, here is really the basic. Um, student as partners, SAP embraces students and teachers working together on teaching and learning and it's inherently process oriented rather than uh, an outcomes driven project. So for a few years now, uh, teaching the nursing students, I've been hearing my nursing students lament on the hardship of life science during our lessons. And I decided we really need to, needed to get to the bottom of it and help them uh, via CAS lessons as well um, to help them a bit more. So I talked to our colleague, uh, Dr. Lisa Cheng, who's coordinating SAP at CAS, and I got the go ahead um, from her and Miranda. And uh, at the start of the project, which ran kind of January to April this year, I asked the guys why they were interested in it. And here is what they said. Uh, so for me, in short, I thought that this project gave us the opportunity to make learning medical terminology more fun and interactive, straying away from the traditional and boring learning methods. Okay, thanks, Marvin. And then Harry also talked about um, team teaching or peer teaching. So the idea of making tasks that could actually get students to teach medical terminology to each other, and that would in turn help them. Um, let's have a look. Nicholas talked about the fact that this was a unique project to be part of and something he wouldn't probably have um, in terms of an exper a fruitful experience like this in university. Philip, who was a fourth year, the only fourth year, the rest were second years love the idea of interacting with other students on a, on a project. Um, Julius and Donald talked about the fact that, you know, the, well, the hardships of the hardship of learning all that medical terminology for their life science, which is their faculty um, uh, content. And the fact that they, you know, they were failing actually because they couldn't really get their head around the medical term, terminology. Donald talked about help, wanting to help improve um, the next year students because they were having such a hard time as well. Okay, so moving on to the progression challenges and high of this very short uh, SAP project. Um, I would say that we had a semi-organized organic, uh, we started in a semi-organized uh, organic manner. So lots of discussion, lots of description of what the students have to do in their nursing faculty, their explanations to me of the faculty courses and their tasks. And then we went on to brainstorming what we could do in the CAS course. Challenges for me uh, really were to keep a balance of the expectation and outcomes for the, for the guys, the students. So keeping it focused on the process um, and you know, not for them not rushing ahead and doing making loads and loads of tasks and and feeling they had to uh, have an outcome. So the the process orientated part of it. 
Um, the highs, I've really got to say the inherent pedagog pedagogical expertise these student has had were amazing. So we were brainstorming types of learning tasks for the course, the CAS course, experimental learning, authentic tasks, peer assessment, peer, uh, you know, peer evaluative. It, I mean, it really astonished me. So in short, um, you know, from, from my experience on this very short uh, uh, project this semester, we really need to ask our students more and more often. Okay, over to Marvin, who's going to show you some of the easier and shorter outcomes that they did create. Thank you, Ashley. So before sharing some of the example of the tasks we made for the project, I would like to draw your attention to a questionnaire we made first. The questionnaire was aimed to get insight regarding students' past medical terminology or other related experiences prior to enrolling to the nursing or CAES courses. So this will help this will then help teachers gain better understanding of students' capabilities and level of knowledge towards medical terminology. So I will not be sharing each of the questions findings with you, but I would like to share one of the findings which I found quite surprising. So the question asked whether students had any prior knowledge of medical terminology before en enrolling into their medical programs. So to our surprise, 90% of them said no. Granted that the sample size was small with only 10 responses, but it's still unusual for students who are supposedly interested in the medical field to not have any prior knowledge about any medical terms. So with that in mind, I'd like to share with you some of the tasks we have for the project. Since most of the students' medical terminology foundation is not rock solid, even for a native English speaker like me, it is like stumbling into unknown territory and it could be quite daunting sometimes. So we made beginner friendly flashcards through Quizlet, just like learning the alphabets when we were little, flashcards serve as a stepping stones for students' medical terminology learning experiences. So it includes the layperson's terms definition, the Chinese translation, which is especially helpful for us locals, and their affixes and some pictures for better visual understanding. So I'm already sure that everyone's already familiar with Quizlet, and it's a variety of ways to learn terms, whether it be it through games or tests. The students have the freedom to choose which learning model suits them. So the next activity or a replacement of an existing assessment we made incorporates the use of nursing students' medical progress notes to learn medical terminology. The previous CIES assessment requires students to find medical excerpts and then uh, to highlight the medical terminology in the text and then write down their affixes and definition. We thought it was more practical for the course to incorporate the use of progress notes so that students can learn how to look through medical progress notes on top of learning medical terminology. It's like killing two birds with one stone. So you may ask how it's more practical to use these progress notes. So on, the, uh, on this slide, in medical settings, we usually write the short forms of medical terminology. As you can see on the leftmost um, progress note, um, one of the highlighted examples is GI bleeding, which is the short term for gastrointestinal bleeding. It is the same with HB, which stands for hemoglobin. Uh, so practical learning makes more sense. It is more effective than just scheming and scanning through an abundance of medical excerpts just to find terms for an assessment. To make it, this makes it more interactive and authentic. Okay, so just to end with, um, what next? So I, I'm going to be the new nursing coordinator Woo, next semester. Very happy about that. So I'd like to discuss uh, the many brainstormed ideas. They've got many, many more that they've come up with. Um, these six guys have come up with. Uh, with the teaching team, we'll decide which ones to integrate into the CAS course as learning and assessment tasks. Um, hopefully implement some team teaching with Marvin and the, and the guys next semester into my class and then continue where and when possible with uh, input from the SAPs. Okay, that's it from us. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, Marvin. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Please have a look. We'll come back to that uh, during the discussion time. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ashley and Martin. And now let's hand over to uh, Tiffany, Tiffany from City U. Thank you. Okay, let me share my screen first. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, so well, I'm Tiffany from uh, the Language Center of City University of Hong Kong, and my project involves the development of a student research showcase and an e-learning website. So, well, let me give you some background about my project. Well, uh, there is one thing that I noticed after teaching in the higher education for a few years. Well, is that um, we teachers we often got different chances to present or share our research findings or experience like uh, in to attend conferences or perhaps to participate in uh, today's events then then we can have then we can share uh, what we think about you know anything about education about research but for our students they do not have so many chances to present the research findings and in fact it's not just about ctu um, in general undergraduates in hong kong have been rarely given any chances to take up the role of presenters in any academic events so what usually happens is that the students finish a research project they submit it they get the grade and then that's it everything is over all right so i have been thinking like would it be good for to to give our students a chance to do something that we teachers usually do uh that is to present their findings to a wider audience outside the classroom and that is why uh in september 2019 i organized the student research showcase which was supported by the teaching development ground of ctu and it allowed the students to present their research findings in the form of academic posters so what happened is that um, there is a course uh, called English for Academic Purposes in the Language Center of CTU. And in the course, the students were require, uh, are required to uh, come up with a topic that they are interested in, they uh, uh, collect data and they analyze the data and write up the discussion and then uh, submit the projects uh, online and let teachers to evaluate it so what i wish the students to do this time is to transform the research findings into academic posters and present it to the wider audience of ctu like this yeah so this is what happened on that day so as you can see on uh, my screen right now uh, the students uh, there are a lot of posters being lined up uh, here and there on a particular location and then what the students did was to stand beside the academic posters that they designed and then present the research findings to to the people in CTU and those people could be really uh, our colleagues can be any staff from different departments of CTU it can even be the principal of CTU where anybody could come okay so uh yeah so as you can see on uh, in the photos the students are presenting yeah their findings to our colleagues in lc this is christy this is stephen Borton, and then uh yeah so this is what happened on that day and so what in order to to understand what the students learn after i mean the student presenters learn after the event i asked them to attend a reflective session and then uh, to tell me what they think about the events and what they feel what have they learned etc and this is what uh, this is what they say uh, in, in the classroom I think uh, in the classroom every time we present the professors or the students just sit and remain silent but during the research showcase the audience put full attention on my poster and I could feel that they were really interested about my topic and they would ask me some question I really share my idea with someone who will hear and that's uh, really impressive and here is what the other student another student said well uh, he uh, said that uh, he presented his academic poster to a PhD student. He said, I was so nervous because he kept on asking questions about my findings. To, con to convince him, I had to explain my data to him in a step-by-step -step manner. And sometimes I needed to provide him with more contextual information. I also told him my personal experience in using the sports facilities in CTU. Here is another student. So uh, I asked them, uh, 
him or her. So when he he or she were the, was designing the poster, did he or she encounter any difficulty or everything was smooth? And he or she said that I need to shorten them or use simple words to replace difficult words. I also needed to select the most important findings to include in the poster since there was not enough space for me to include everything. So through interviewing the students, I could see that they enjoy the learning process and they also learn a lot about communicating with different audience in CTU and the way to design an academic poster on their own. And then most importantly, the learning process do not just stop here. Um, after the event was over, in fact, I, uh, let me see. I transform everything into an e-learning website. So this is the e-learning website that I uh, constructed after the event. And so what's so special about this e-learning website is that the materials about academic poster, about poster presentation, they are all from the student presenters. So this, after the event was over, everything was put up onto an e-learning website where everyone can come and then they could get to know uh, the way to design an academic poster properly by referring to uh, uh, different resources and also some samples from our student presenters. And also afterwards, they can do some self-directed analysis like this one. This is also a poster designed by the student presenters. And they can even do some uh, uh, test their knowledge about poster presentation and also academic posters by uh, doing a very simple self-directed tweaks like this. Okay, so well, in other words, the learning process do not just stop after the event is over. In fact, the students transfer the knowledge that they acquired in this research showcase to a wider audience even after everything was over. Yes, so uh, to draw a conclusion to uh, this project, um, uh, it allows our undergraduates to present in a non-classroom academic contest, of course. And then what is important is that the knowledge transfer process can continue even after the event is over. Yeah, that's all of my presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Now we have listened to three presentations. There are two questions in the chat room and also feel free to ask. All right. Um, peace. So two questions. So I think Ashley said she would answer the first one now. Thanks. Yeah? Uh, um, okay. So in the nursing um, course that we have for CAS, we actually have a glossary of all the medical terminology, the suffixes, the pre uh, prefixes and the roots. So the way we teach the nursing students is through the linguistic uh, uh, way of uh, getting them to learn these medical terminology. In their life sciencing faculty, they don't learn it in this way. They have to learn the concepts and, and how it is, uh, is applied. Um, so so the, the guys, uh, I mean, uh, Marvin, you can jump in when you want. Um, the guys made the, the Quizlet from um, the, the glossary and they added, they, they felt that, that they needed the Chinese translations to make it easier and the, and the pictures. Um, so the guys got together and they we talked about in the brainstorm how we can actually, how they could actually benefit from learning, uh, you know, this, this medical terminology. So all the, all the ideas they've come up with, I mean, I've got a long list of brilliant ideas that I can in, implement. Um, it's basically from us brainstorming about how they learn and how they learn, they feel they learn the best. Marvin, anything? Uh, so actually, I actually tried doing the test in Quizlet and having the pictures really helped a lot because uh, for visual for visual memorization, because um, in Hong Kong, we usually just memorize a lot of things. And after the test, we just forget everything. But with actually like visual understanding of the, the terms actually helps with a more like long-term understanding of the term instead of just forgetting it after like some test or some assessment. So having like Quizlet with flashcards would really help with like 
like it's just like Legos, like it's just a foundation for for um for us uh, for teachers to use to teach students. Just like building, just like building blocks, like just as I said before in the present, it's like a stepping stone for students to incorporate them in more, uh, more advanced uses, uh, like for example in medical um medic in a medical setting or in just assessment or test. So, so Sarah, thanks, Marvin. Sarah, I'm not sure if that was the answer. So the usage. The, the Quizlet is actually helping them, you know, they have to memorize. There's no way out for the medic, medical students and the nursing students. They have to, they have to memorize uh, the medical terminology and the concepts that are connected with it and how it's applied. Uh, there's no way out of it. So uh, I, I think, Marvin, it, I mean, you can answer, you know, can it help with, with usage? Um, Sarah, what do you actually mean by usage, actually? Maybe we can clarify that. Hi, thanks, Ashley. Yeah, um, just that I've been working with students uh, on honors projects and um, science students, and they uh, they had been using Quizlet, but uh, were really struggling in transferring the knowledge that they had gained from that almost decontextualized uh, information about the vocabulary items to the context of understanding how those words were used in different forms. Um, in articles they were reading, and then also being able to use them correctly in, in sentences, uh, and uh, understanding how to use different forms of the same word in, in certain sentences, and uh, a variety of sentence types as well. So I was just wondering um, whether, because you uh, presented that you, you developed um, this uh, vocabulary set in Quizlet, whether there was a feature there that could also help to contextualize in order to um, you know, mitigate some of the, the difficulties that students have when they're trying to transfer the knowledge both to their reading and their writing. So that was really where the yeah. question was coming from. I, I think you know, the, the fact that, that the second uh, task that Mar uh, Marvin uh, created with, with the guys, that the progress checks, these were real progress checks from their life science. So they've got all the medical um, abbreviations and terminology there. So that's how the usage could be applied. So as Marvin said just now, the, the kind of Quizlet was the beginner. He actually used the word, you know, the beginner. So at the beginning of the course where they know nothing, you know, about, well, the first, the first nursing lesson we, we have with them, we actually teach them how to read backwards, uh, you know, the suffix, the root, and the prefix. Um, if there is one uh, in terms of the medical terminology. So it really is the, the beginning point. We, we've actually got uh, Quizlets, uh, Quizlets. I think Amy, who's here, she, I think she's, uh, was it Lorena? Um, one of, one of uh, my colleagues here at this, at this uh, sharing, they, they've actually made um, Quizlets. But what the guys have done here is one step further where they're incorporating the Chinese because they're gonna be working in, you know, 80%, 90% Cantonese. Um, although the, the, of course, the medical terminology is in, in English, uh, hopefully the conceptualizing um, of the, you know, the, the, the disease, the condition um, can help them a little bit further. So having a look at everything, the visual, the Chinese, the English, the prefix, the suffix and the root and having the whole story and the definition. Um, and then that can help with the next part with something like the progress checks um, that they have to, you know, look at in, in labs and then be able to um i think do case studies marvin i think if i remember correctly uh yes yes about the progress notes for the because we have to read through a lot of them and not not a lot of them are like really short ones they're actually really long like the ones we showed for example just like maybe the first page there's maybe like six to eight pages of the progress notes with a lot of medical terminology. We have to look through every single one. And most of us actually don't know because most of the medical, uh, the progress notes are in English and having like some of the Chinese translations um, really help for especially locals because I, I'm not really, I'm not from Hong Kong, I'm from the Philippines. So I, I don't have a lot of problems with this, but uh, after asking a lot of my friends, like my local friends, they really struggle a lot, especially just for the definitions part. They can't understand each individual, like 
um before I enrolled, I don't uh, I'm not really good with like prefixes, suffix, and roots. I actually ne- not I don't know a lot about it. So having like like decon- uh, deconstructing each of the words, like each part, helps with um constructing the the whole meaning towards it. Like um for example, I asked one of uh, Nicholas actually took the exam and he actually used the CAES way uh CSES ways of um deconstructing the words first. He actually didn't know the whole word's meaning, but he deconstructed the word per meaning and then actually um, knew how knew what the word's definition during the exams. Right. Okay. Thank you, Ashley and Mavin. And uh, that is one question, one more question there, but we have to move on. So can Tiffany quickly answer the question from uh, Anthea about the uh, posters? Yeah, well, uh, I didn't teach the students anything about poster design or poster presentation before the event. There are two reasons for that. Well, first of all, um, because the presentation was really short, so I didn't mention it. In fact, the the project was based on a discovery-based learning approach so that the students can discover the knowledge on their own. Uh, So rather than teaching them, instructing them the way to design a poster, I allow them to self-discover all the ways, all the techniques in creating a poster. And secondly, I try to make the event as close to the academic conference that we usually have, as, as close as possible. So that, well, because just like HKCPD conference, before the conference, there wouldn't be anyone teaching us how to create a, a PowerPoint, how to do this and that. So I try to make it as close to the academic uh, events that we usually attend as possible, so that all those things are eradicated on purpose. Great, thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you. Um, the first group of presenters, we will have the overall discussion at the end. So now I'll hand over to Christy. Uh, she'll moderate the second part of the presentations. Christy? Hi. Uh, can Lucas show the second part of the PowerPoint? Yes. Uh, so for the next part, we have uh, people upon your team. Uh, we have uh, Vincent, um, uh, Dr. Andy Morrow, talking about the inv- investigation of the uh, using of AI to enhance physical learning space. So all these three topics are more closely related to self-assess, um, ELSS uh, stuff. And some are about uh, how to make use of the, uh, uh, the, the learning resources. So um, the, the second presenter will be uh, Jay Bidels and Dr. Linda Lin, okay, who will be talking about the use of ebooks to boost uh, the vocabulary acquisition. And the last would be Dr. Zhou Chen, who will be talking about how to re engineer the Self Assessed Language Center, which would be also very interesting. So, could we now call upon um, the first one, the first group to present? Thanks a lot. Uh, Andy will be presenting first, and I'm sharing the screen. With everyone now. Hey, hi everybody. Welcome to our session. If you can see and hear me and you're on video, please give me a thumbs up so that I know I'm getting through to you. Can you give me a thumbs up? Okay, <laughs> I can see a thumb coming up. Thank you. Um, so what we're going to talk about is the feasibility of using a robot for English language learning. Um, to be more precise, the real question is, should you get a robot for your self-access center? So next slide, please, Vincent. So the outline of what we're going to talk about today is I'm briefly going to do the introduction about the robot project, and then I'll hand over to my colleague, Vincent, who'll tell you about the findings and the implications. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we'll go from left to right. So first of all, CIL, C-I-L-L, is our Center for Independent Language Learning, which is our self-access center. And it's our learner-centered physical space where our students can come and talk to a teacher, for example, and learn about English. It also provides key access to ELC services, for example, workshops. However, as most of us realize, there's been a number of problems with self-access over the past year. 
Uh, because of COVID-19 and the closing of some of our facilities, there's been no teacher cover at the help desk and we can't have teachers on duty all the time, even after the flu has gone away, just because of the uh, number of resources that that would take. Looking at the right side of the slide, what we've had to do is shift the mode of delivery from face-to-face -to, -face to online teaching. So we've got an online help desk, we've got online workshops, and we've got online WAP, which is Writing Assistance Program, and SAP, which is Speaking Assistance Program. Next slide, please. So there's been a number of services which we've had to suspend. For example, the SIL tours that the help desk teacher used to do to show students how to use the center and also the help desk used to provide immediate help to meet the students' basic needs. And because there isn't a teacher there at the moment, we couldn't do that either. Okay, next slide, please. So to help us cover for these problems, we bought a robot, which is called TEMI, T-E-M-I is pronounced TEMI. Um, artificial intelligence or AI um, is being progressively integrated into education. And also we have some human machine interaction. This is the wave of the future. And we hope that it can improve motivation um, and that students might find a robot less forbidding and less judgmental than a teacher. And also the robot can facilitate self-directed learning because students can ask questions to the robot and the robot can give them replies that fit those questions. So the robot is humanoid, just about. It looks like a love child of Darth Vader and an iPad, but we're working on fixing that and improving it. It's programmable so we can make it do what we want within certain limitations that we'll talk about. And therefore it's a tailor-made platform which is appropriate to our educational context because we can make adaptations to how the robot interfaces with the students. Next slide, please, Vincent. Okay, so the robot has got two types of apps on it. App one is the guided SIL tours where the robot drives around our self-access center, introducing the center and its facilities to the students, depending on which of our uh, subjects that they're taking, it can point out different things that are useful for them. And it can also act in kiosk mode as an information center and it can answer the students' questions. The students say, hey, Temi, and then the robot will listen to their question and try to identify the best answer for them. Okay, that's it from me, and I'll now hand over to my colleague, Vincent, who will talk about the findings. Hi, uh, this is Vincent speaking. Uh, last semester, we finished our three-month part of study. We collected feedback from students using Google Dialog Flow that enables us to be aware of their needs from a new angle and opinions from the teacher survey that analyze the perceived value on the robots. To make it clear, the robot keeps the whole dialogue every time when a student speaks to it that horizontally records what the time the interaction takes place, virtually records what the questions are, and more importantly, how often a particular workshop course or activity that has been recommended to them. I would say what's valuable to the ELC is not only the robot itself, but also the big data it collects. Here's the analysis. In a graph, you can see the frequency of interactions ranging from only one to two times on the first day to around 10 times on the final day within two random weeks. This table shows part of the student inquiries. As you might have noticed, they are, ca they are categorized, of which information about LCR, there's a second row, seems to be in favor with the students. Google Dialog Flow also provides a page that shows each and all question asked and how the robot answers them. Interestingly, on the 25th, that's the first row, uh, the first line, on the 25th of February, somebody asked how to improve English in Seattle. And later in March, somebody told the robot to shut up. <laughs> in these scenarios, uh, the robot wouldn't be able to provide any answers, partly because uh, those keywords such as Seattle and shut up are not linked to our database and mainly because Tammy is a pure angel. It would just say, can you say it again as a reply to the user? So overall, we received a total of 77 questions during a pilot. Note that these questions are usually uh, received in the morning. 
Surprisingly, many users tried to toy with Tammy asking the robot to move around when it was actually in its inquiry mode. So after our data study, the responses by the robots were usually relevant to our electives and massive open online courses. It seems that students would like to come to our center and get much of this information. One point to note, our calculation shows for the questions that were asked and successfully received, the answers that matched these questions were incredibly accurate. We didn't expect the accurate weight, accuracy rates to be that high, realizing that pronunciation by the users and sound processing by the robot have been two factors that determine the robot response. But now the number eases our mind, leaving us little worry about being an impediment. Now, what does the result mean to the ELC then? Uh, with these statistics, our center heads could be more aware of what might interest students most in our language, language learning center when they are books in and book out. <coughs> and if our current workshops, services, and programs are the places that meet their needs. More importantly, we have the recorded data to claim that more students hit sell at specific times, so we know when we need more manpower in our learning center. So how about at one, the guided SEAL tool then? As seen in the survey results, as now you can see on the slide, teachers who responded find the tool clear and useful with good pacing. They also comment um, the tool could be part of independent learning, while students, especially freshmen, could be more centrally informed of our services and facilities. So in closing, um, the pilot enables us to be aware of both problems and opportunities for improvements. Later this summer, we will add in new instructions covering the listed items, as you can see now on the screen, so that nobody will keep asking Tammy to move around when it is on it too. And it doesn't, and it doesn't, doesn't actually. That might not destroy their, their robot romance. Secondly, we will also have a, we have also had a proposal for improving Xiaomi, including our database, internet connections, and its appearance. That's currently less uh, endearing. So our center had uh, our, to make it specific. Our extended had one described Xiaomi as a window into possible future direction, and we and we also have learned from scholarly studies that the legacy of language education has shaped traditional developments will soon become untenable when more and more technologies have formed various learning landscapes. We can watch us become horizontally instead of irrelevant vertically. With these directions and moving forward, we will have bigger fish to fry, I'm sure. Thanks all for listening. This was about two and a half years of Andy's and my life. Thank you. Um, we will, uh, there are a number of questions that we will answer, uh, we will ask the speaker to answer. Uh, next is Gay Bidal, um, Jay Bidal and Dr. Linda Lim. Sorry, Jay Bidal, Bidal. Jay Bidal, yeah. So, uh, I'm sharing the, uh, the PPT, oops, one is not here. Sorry. Um. So today we're going to talk about um, an academic vocabulary project that uh, we've been piloting um, in one of the EAP courses at PolyU. And uh, basically uh, it involves uh, a number of activities uh, incorporated into uh, an e-textbook format. And uh, We've used both the textbook format and trying to embed the activities directly into the LMS so that it communicates better with um, the, uh, the grade book and grade center and, and tracking of student results. Sorry, for some reason, this uh, PPT does not come. Um, Jay, can you do it? Okay, just one sec. Let's see. Du, 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 du. PowerPoint. Oh yeah, actually it's here now, so for some reason. Okay, there we go. Right. Sorry, it's here okay, now. Great. Yep. Yeah, so uh, you will make it, okay. Okay. Yeah, so we call it kind of a, 
interactive academic vocabulary learning tool. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in terms of next slide, Linda, in terms of our goals, uh, you know, for this project, we uh, developed four of these eBooks for independent learning for students. Uh, in uh, some of our courses, we have what we call indie work. And so uh, th this is independent work that students are expected to accomplish. And uh, so we uh, piloted uh, vocabulary, academic vocabulary learning as part of this uh, independent learning. And so we wanted to um, you know, get students to uh, basically learn academic words and contacts and, and try to push towards also uh, you know, active um, vocabulary knowledge as opposed to just passive in terms of form or meaning. And also uh, address, you know, like uh, raising their awareness about the different aspects of vocabulary, so, you know, uh, to help them in their future um, vocabulary learning like uh, collocations and connotation and things like that, okay? Next slide, Linda. And, and uh, clearly, you know, we want, you know, we wanted to test this idea that, you know, perhaps more systematic learning of vocabulary, especially academic vocabulary, as opposed to kind of more of a uh, um, less systematic approach in the current courses might benefit students. And uh, we, uh, for our source uh, word list, we went to the new academic word list, uh, the NAWL. And uh, this is this has about 960 words. Um, but uh, we focused, uh, basically, I, I took this 960 words and I put it into about 19 themes or topics. And we chose four of these themes or topics. Um, with about 47 to 49 words each. And as you can see, there's government, society, communication, and human experience. Now keep in mind the new academic word list basically you know, um, created this list uh, of most common or frequent academic words across a number of disciplines, right? And so um, even though these are kind of um, topic specific, um, themes, uh, they also have more general academic applicability, I think. Okay, next slide, Linda. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, Go ahead. And so Linda's going to talk a little about the content now, and then I'll come back later to show you some examples. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Linda. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as uh, Jay said at the very beginning, that our objective is to make sure that students not only understand the meaning, the form, the meaning, and what we actually also want students to do is to um, understand how the, they can be used. This is very closely related to, you know, the Kang Kang Yu team just now talk about. They use Chris Late or something. So what we do is we actually use the ebook to address this issue. So what we actually have the content here is the, the beginning part is uh, um, get students to understand the meaning because like the Hong Kong Yu team said, just meaning for students is really important. So what we did was we put a word list and this word list is uh, linked to online dictionary. And then based on the word list, the student get used to know the meaning and then they do some warm up activities. These warm up activities normally are kind of very interactive games like matching games, like a handman or this kind of games. So students will actually get used to these words, know the meaning by playing games. And then after that, we start to focus on the use, not only on the meaning, now we can start to on the word use. And then when we actually do this on the word use, the first part, what do we do is we actually focus on different aspects of the word knowledge, which we will talk about that later on. And the next very important thing is like, we don't feel like the word should be used just as words. So we want to link them to different kinds of language skills. So we also have activities to link them to activities. Yeah, so the, just now I was talk, talking about, you know, the at the beginning, what, what kind of games they have. They have crossword, they have word search, they have handman, so this kind of games they use um, to get used to, to understand the meaning of words. And then for word use, we actually try to address different aspects of a word. So knowing a word basically means knowing all different kinds of aspects of the word, for example, collocation, for example, word forms, synonyms, and of course, that also include end names and uh, uh, affix um, and uh, the uh, connotation. We put connotation there as well. And then, based on that, we put them 
together with some grammar, with the lexical grammar, put them together. And uh, so it's not only lexical grammar, it's a kind of like, a, um, you know, words and then grammar putting together. And in the end, we also put something interesting, that's idioms. So we put some idioms, idioms there as well. Okay, now the, uh, the type type of activities and um, the first part will be the kind of short answer questions students you know answer questions that is put word into use and the next one is a uh, reading comprehension and after reading we ask questions and the big that that reading students learn how to uh, use those words. And the next part uh, a lot of students really like is uh, uh, listening. They actually combine listening together with, uh, you know, uh, word use. So after students listen um, to uh, some passages, they actually then answer questions. And that's another way of learning. And of course, uh, other part will be kind of like editing, proofreading, that kind of exercise. Again, so we use different activities to kind of like improve uh, students' opportunities to make the words, I mean, interesting and uh, for them to learn. And of course, that uh, get them to understand different aspects of the words. Okay, and uh, so we actually, th this project, we, we actually um, started last year and then uh, we actually started to pilot and then we have two rounds of pilot. The first round of pilots, we actually had uh, uh, seven participating groups. We have five teachers involved. We used uh, the first two volumes of the eBooks. And then we put that into a download eBook forms. And after that, we had a questionnaire and uh, we have, we, by the way, we got a very positive um, feedback from students, and we also had a focus group interviews. So that's what happened after the first semester, the first trial. And then the second trial, that's what we just finished, that's the second trial. Um, Jay, would you like to explain this, or would you like me to finish? You can just finish this uh, slide, okay. Linda, go ahead. Okay, the second round of um, this one is like we this time we got uh, uh, five participating groups, and this time in order to uh, to later on to be able to compare with different kinds of students. We also have three control groups and we have three teachers uh, involved. We use a different um, ebooks, volume three and four, but this time we directly uh, used the university's uh, LMS. Yeah. And uh, the data collection for this one, uh, very comprehensive. We, we have pre-tests pre and uh, post-test, we also have questionnaires, and then we also had a semi-structured um, interviews, and we also have a focus group discussion. So what we are, with all this data collection, what we're trying to find out is how students actually really um, feel what they achieved, and uh, to what extent they really like this ebook, and to what extent they feel like what we can do to make it even better. Yeah, so we, um, from the first pilot, we did get some uh, positive feedback and, um, uh, you know, some of it was connected with uh, the idea that the activities went beyond just students uh, memorizing the meaning or memorizing, you know, getting a translation or something like that, seeing the words in context and seeing how they're used with other words and seeing how they're combined with other words and, and some of the different aspects that perhaps students weren't uh, aware of as much because part of the goal is not only for them to learn these words to, but to get a, a deeper understanding of what it means to learn um, academic vocabulary and and of course there is multiple exposure all throughout the, the books yeah so. okay so just uh, I know we don't have a lot of time but uh, I'm going to just show you just quickly so I'm going to share my screen now um, okay um, let's see Let me here. Uh, stop sharing yeah, please. I got it. Okay. I think everyone can see that, right? Um, yeah. So this is uh, the um, word list page. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's color coded according to uh, word type, and then you can click on it and it takes you to an online dictionary with various pieces of information. And then there's, uh, as, as Linda mentioned, there's various activities. So the meaning and finding uh, you know, finding words within that, and then same with the crossword. Okay, so this this is not scored, okay, in terms of their independent learning, it's just giving them a chance to practice it. And, and then we have various activities here, you can see on the side, uh, collocations and word forms. Um, so for example, allocate allocation, so they have to 
read the sentence and decide whether it's a noun or adjective that goes in there, okay? Um, and then of course there's automatic feedback uh, at the end and they can check their answers and, and resubmit if they want. Uh, this is uh, for example, just identifying, um, you know, so we give them a, a, one of the wordless words and they have to go through, see it in the sentence and decide if it's transitive or intransitive. Uh, okay, Thank kind you. of labeling or identifying. Thank you. Um, I think it's time for the last speaker of this session. Um, Joe Chen? Yeah, hello. Uh, uh, Dr. Yeah. Joe Chen, okay. Yeah, yeah. we'll talk about right. the self assistant. Yeah, so hope that uh, you can see the uh, point. Okay. Yeah. Right, uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, I'm Joe Chen, the, I'm the uh, coordinator of the self access Center in the Hong Kong Public University. And then we call that the CIU, that means the Center for Independent uh, Language Learning, right? Oh, the second slide, okay. And I would like to divide my talk into three areas. Uh, the first part would be the uh, background of the two-year project. And then I would like to introduce my, uh, the Language Center Handbook uh, 2021, uh, because the, the detail of the project has been, uh, you know, uh, will be published in that uh, handbook. And then I will, uh, instead of going into the detail, I will tell you the brief outcome of the project, okay, uh, to share with you. Um, okay, uh, so this uh, two-year project uh, was investigated by Dr. Uh, Vicky Lee and, and me, and it was uh, given, uh, funded by the, uh, the Language Enhancement uh, Grant, okay, uh, $140,000 uh, by the, you know, uh, it's a kind of a teaching development project, right? And then uh, this project, uh, we uh, have three main phases. Okay, in phase one, we use the online questionnaire and also the focus uh, uh, group interview uh, to uh, were conducted to solicit the feedback from the um, uh, from the uh, user. Okay, and on on the uh, for example, like the learning material, facility, language support, etc. And then for the phase two, and then uh, we uh, collect the feedback on on shape the changes. Okay, made the center. And then for the last phase, uh, we try to focus on the evaluation on those changes made to the center, see whether the, the user will feel happy or uh, unhappy for a certain area, okay? And I hope that we, uh, the strategies of okay, adopting the project will be uh, able to reform or transform or re-engineer the service center, we provide some insight. Okay, and then uh, the Lego Center Handbook 2021, uh, and then um, uh, it, we have written about 10,000 words on, on that book chapter, okay? And uh, there will be, it, I, I guess it will be published in, in, in July. And then uh, there will be a conference on the IALT Language Center, Management Language Center Design of the Volume. And for those uh, areas, cover the topics related to language center management, design, etc. okay? And then uh, the resources uh, may be useful for us to, to, uh, to refer to. And they also provide the valuable information for people to understand what language centers do and how they differ, okay? So, uh, and for Vicky and I, I've written a chapter on the self center. So if any one of you are planning for the future uh, submission of the language center handbook 2023, uh, you feel free to contact me. I, I can tell you about the journey, okay? Uh, the whole journey on, on our whole submission. Okay, now I would like to focus on the, uh, the, the outcome of the project. Uh, and actually, there are altogether five uh, distinct uh, characteristics for this uh, project, okay? Uh, we would like to design the seal uh, to set up the analysis system, organize those materials uh, so that they can be user-friendly, and we would like to have a more variety of the learning materials. And in the past, we have conducted what we call a seal seminar, later on called seal workshop. Later on in this project, we've uh, transformed it into the theme week workshop. And then we would like to provide more regular uh, language support services. Okay, you can see this is a holistic picture of our uh, 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 service center seal. Okay, and then uh, in the past, before the re-engineering, you can find the uh, ones didn't come because they want to use the computer. Okay, and because they okay uh, they, they 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 just want to have a place similar to the library. Okay, and then you can see the uh, the style very traditional. Okay, the computer the, the very traditional style. Okay. But now, uh, because we want to re-engineer, so I got a chance to visit, uh, Connie and I visit uh, different places. And I still remember when we visit uh, Hong Kong, you are actually, okay? Uh, welcome us, okay? And they show us a, a tour. And then we have gone through uh, five universities, the Center, UST, Baptist University, U, Hong Kong, U, and Hang Seng University. 
our observation is that the student prefer more open, uh, not crowded, more flexible, okay? Uh, and also more uh, learning spaces, okay? They do not need a computer, uh, but they need a space, okay, for them to uh, chat. So we, that's the reason why we develop an idea called Noisy Song. And then uh, nowadays, the young people, they like to sit on a big bed, okay, to chat, uh, to, to, to read, uh, to, you know, to, to have fun. And so we set up the, like, like the, the high bar chair, the table, and then the teachers and the students can sit there uh, to have, uh, with a very more relaxing uh, environment, okay? So we set up the noisy zone. And um, this area, uh, you can see Jay, okay, uh, presenting workshop. Actually, uh, that, that area was the, what we call the help desk, but it was hidden at the corner. So we moved the uh, help desk uh, just near the, uh, the counter so that the student can see it. And then we use this area to develop, okay, uh, for the uh, workshop, for the theme with workshop, all right. And then uh, we also try to make it green, more indoor plant. Uh, during the, for example, in September, we have uh, the big autumn festivals uh, decoration. In October, the Halloween, uh, the you know, November, the Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, try to, try to make it more you know, friendly to the student. And then we also uh, 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 formulate what we call the writable wall. So the uh, teachers and the students can doodle on the wall to, to have fun. And we also have two mobile computers on wheel. And then you can see some pictures, okay? Uh, the the, the, the interprints and then some decoration for Christmas. And then you can see uh, our teachers and uh, students doodle on the wall okay, to relax uh, to have fun. And then uh, the, the mocha, okay? The movable cow on uh, wheels, okay? So the student can have uh, some kind of discussion, okay? Uh, in, uh, together. And we organize our materials. In the past, we have materials on exam areas like IOS, Gmail, and TOEFL. But now our students told us that they really want some more about the common recruitment exam, which is the uh, if they want to apply for a government job, they need to sit for this uh, examination. So we also provide some kind of workshop and materials. And also we also we engineering uh, the uh, the whole incentive scheme, the bronze, silver, and gold. And after the re-engineering, there was an increase of 26% on the total of number of, of awardees. Okay, we based on the uh, st study skill handbook. I, I, I still remember Andy, okay, re recommend this to us. And then uh, if students can get the award, like silver and gold, their photo will be put on the wall. And if they got a gold award, we will also write the recommendation letter to the department head. Okay, and uh, the student want more of a material, especially the request on the personal statement, because they really want to exchange program. They need to write a, a, a personal statement, no matter for overseas study or the exchange program. So we have developed a, a, a sample, some samples on the personal statement. And also many students want to more, get more guidance on their final year project, also step-by-step -step guidance. And uh, we find more students, especially the master and uh, PhD students, they want to have more sample on the uh, for, for them. So we develop what we call the uh, corner for research student, in which uh, you can find some confirmation report and also the uh, some sample dissertation. I remember uh, Linda, okay, developed all this for us. And um, we have developed a, a number of theme week, not only on uh, English speaking, English vocabulary, uh, for, for me, I also uh, use this area to teach my students on how to use the flexibar therapy to reduce the fat or to relieve the left pain and back pain, okay? So try to also improve their spoken and, and, and practice English. And uh, for the provision of more regular uh, service, like the past, our students find this quite random, random schedule. But we would like to make it more regular, like for the lunch time, okay, 12.30, 1.30, or, or the afternoon, 3.34. So students can come if they have any immediate question on how to write their application letter, how to uh, write their, for example, personal statement. They can sit, uh, get to the help desk and then move it, the help desk to the corner. And also the writing assistance program, speaking assistance program, okay, the help desk you can see. And then we would like uh, students uh, can book two times, online 50 minutes uh, per section. Okay, and then uh, they can uh, get some kind of uh, feedback guidance on the writing and speaking, all right? So uh, that's all for my uh, sharing. So if you want to know more detail about the uh, this project, uh, okay, the Language Center Handbook uh, will uh, cover all the detail, okay? Thanks a lot. Thank you, Joe. And now it's for the Q&A time. We did have a couple of questions about the robot. Oh, yes, this what is Andy. Yeah. One, one of yeah. the questions what, what, that came up was yeah. how expensive is it? 
Um, How it costs ex- about 20,000 for the robot itself, but you really need the support package that goes with it. So we spent all together about 100,000. Um, actually, Artemis is a store-bought robot, uh, so at a reasonable price. It wasn't expensive, but it's just under, uh, I remember the price of under 30,000 Hong Kong dollars after some bargains. It isn't expensive, but it can move around, dodging every single object, uses 5G, auto uh, navigation, and more important, speak good English accents. We find that not all robots uh, in the market speak the US or UK accents very beautifully. And TAM isn't a uh, poly innovations. Then the reason for us not to make one ourselves is that it costs uh, more than $10 million to create an AI program, plus employing people with AI expertise to take care of the robots. So to take advantage of a uh, commercial robots, we could focus more on the app programs with our partners uh, and examine how these programs could be beneficial to our current independent learning services. So uh, what, one, one question for myself, okay. Um, in order to enable the, the robot to go to a specific location in the services center, okay, do you need to um, uh, install any algorithm to teach them the location of resources material? Here is our writing assessment um, program. Here is our IOS material. Yeah, we need to write the scripts um, and save the particular spots that, so that the robot can actually move around and stop at particular spots, face face the students and begin the introductions. It can be uh, it can be different routes introducing different spots to students, uh, particular to a specific group like uh, PhD students, uh, bachelor degree students, and that's why we have currently have uh, five uh, tools at the moment. Uh, the robot has an internal map in its mind so you can say hey temi go to the reception and it will then go to the reception because it knows where it is and it knows where the reception is on its map are there any questions okay for for example for joe and for um Just the ebook team. Yeah. Because some of yeah. because some of the question has been answered. Okay, so yeah. Child, oh, you have a question. Uh, she's yeah, she's yeah. Yeah. I found my colour pizza. Do you do you see that you can anticipate any competition with other AIs that students already have? Like that they already have the Siri and Google Assistant. Do you see that there are there will be any competition with you know, the students' AIs rather than coming to the center. They already have, have been using some. Right? Mm. Um, now, one another reason for us to have AI robots in, the, in our center is to uh, survive physical center in university because we have been discussing um, if we should actually close all physical centers in across different universities. And we also want to encourage students to have their independent learning, having no humans, uh, I don't mean no human, but um, having more their motivation to ask the questions and understand themselves whether it is actually their needs instead of ha- getting much or, or overly, um, or getting too much help from teachers. So whenever they come to uh, our center, they will get help from the robots that provides actually basic answers to basic questions. And of course, if they have got specific questions like, how can I improve my accents? What's wrong with this? I think the robot would not be responsible for this. It would be teachers. Yeah, if I can add, um, the difference between Temi and things like Alexa is that we've programmed Temi with knowledge about English language learning and knowledge about our center that um, other systems don't know about. And to make it clear, um, um, because the robots could be more responsible for basic questions. So teachers could focus more on higher order questions, right? Like, uh, how can I actually write up better personal statements in this case? Thank you. I think there is one question for Jay and Linda. 
Uh, have you considered using any enhancement techniques such as pictures or videos in the warm-up activities in your ebook to foster learners uptick or vocabulary? Yeah, I, I did respond in the chat, but yeah, just briefly, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was some time pressure, but uh, also some um, design limitations to the license type. But uh, we are trying to replace book widgets with um, just the uh, in-house created widgets that will give us some freedom to do that. And yeah, we were thinking of using video, for example, for introducing the various aspects of vocabulary and telling the students visually that way. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. So. Back to Lillian. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is now the uh, little break time. Um, can Lucas remind us um, how much time we have to adjust a little bit here? Lucas, you're helping us with the yeah, yeah. keeping uh, that around, time. Around eight, eight minutes delay. All right, eight minutes too late. Okay, <laughs> let's say we take a very short uh, washroom break and then come back in five minutes. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Yes, Thank yes. you very much. We still have another two group, uh, group, two sessions of presentations and the overall discussion at the end. Thank you. See you in five minutes.